My name's Denise Schick, and I am passionate talking to anybody about this because as a child growing up with a father that identified as being transgender, I understand the pain that secretly many families are hiding, as well as our loved ones that are suffering alone. I understand as a child the trauma that children experience when losing a parent to another identity. It was a summer day when my life had changed. I was washing the dishes, my mother was at work, and my dad walked in the door and he said, Denise, come on outside, I wanna talk with you. And we sat on a small hill outside of our home. And the first words out of his mouth were, I wanna become a woman. I didn't have any idea um, how this would change my life. I was trying to comprehend as a nine-year-old girl what this honestly meant. By the time I was 11 and 12 years old, I started to develop very young. And uh, unfortunately, my dad became very envious, such as him beginning to wear my clothes, noticing that my dressers had been boggled into and finding my clothing behind the bathroom towels. And so I started to move the soap containers and everything and realized that there he actually had a peak hole. And so I realized I now had lost my privacy. And so it was almost a fight for, for freedom, a fight to become a woman and to feel comfortable in that. I started to question, maybe God really did make a mistake. Maybe dad should have been a girl. And if so, what did that mean for me? How did I know that maybe I was supposed to be a boy as well? So it started a different layer of turmoil and me trying to find my own identity in the middle of this chaos. This picture reminds me of what I had experienced by the grade of sixth. I know by this time I had experienced trauma with my dad as he would chase me around the yard to knock me down on the ground and put his hands over my breast and he put them on my breast so hard that it made me feel like he was trying to pretend that my breasts were his. This is a picture of eighth grade. And what this reminds me of was the thought processing that I went through with considering suicide and the fact that I just wanted to go to sleep and not be in pain anymore. So by the time I was 15, I was realizing that alcohol wasn't numbing the pain anymore. And I started to consider drugs. I hung out with a few girls that would get high and go to these parties, and I thought maybe that's the answer. And again, God was amazing in how he stifled and, and stopped me from going in different directions. Because at this point, I met a young boy by the name of Mark, and he just had a, a great interest in getting to know me as a friend. I was drawn to this young man who was a Christ follower. And like, why is he so happy? You know, what is this that he has this peace about him? I then started to learn about Jesus Christ. And so it was at the age of 15, I accepted the Lord as my savior. That relationship developed with Mark. I ended up marrying him a couple months after high school graduation. Now on my wedding day, I walked up to meet my dad before going up to the aisle. And as he put his hand, uh, his arm in my arm to walk up, he looked over at me and he simply had said, I wish it were me in that gown. When I was 28 years old, my mother sat us all down in the living room. She, uh, she looked at us and she said, your dad's leaving me to become a woman. She said, your father's out in the garage if anybody would like to go speak with him. And so I went out with a last plea. I entered the garage and he turned around and looked at me. He had on the makeup and the women's earrings, but he resembled his mother so much that I felt like I was looking at my grandmother. And I just looked at him and I said, please stay, please get some help. We don't want you to leave. If you go to pursue this other identity and become a woman, then I'm saying goodbye to my father. How do you explain this? That your father's still alive, but he's not your father anymore. And now I have four young children. 
how do I share this, that grandpa was in their life and now grandpa's not here. But what I didn't expect was to go into a depression for the first time in my life. I would put the covers over my head, I would draw the drapes. I just wanted to be in darkness. That's the way I felt. When I realized how bad it was, it was when you are actually telling your feet, you can get out of bed, Denise. Put one foot down, but then you crawl back into bed. And then you tell yourself again, put one foot down. Okay, Denise, put the other foot down. Embarrassment and shame, sure, isolation, most definitely. Families, we didn't have anybody to help support us. We didn't have a pastor that understood this. And here we are grieving the loss of somebody that's really still alive. One thing with a funeral is that you have a funeral, there's closure. There's no closure for families that face situations like this. And so as um, he had left, uh, my heart grew very hard, very cold towards him. And he would attempt to reach out to me through letters. And in the beginning, for probably the first year, year and a half, you're hoping, okay, dad's gonna come home. You know, he's going to want help. You'd open up the letter and only to find out that he's gone deeper in. So it got to the point where I knew that I had to refuse the letter. I had to start refusing because trying to mentally and emotionally be well for my own family. 13 years went by that I didn't talk to my dad, but that heart grew colder towards him. Unforgiveness started to really fester. My mom called me again and she said, your dad's dying of cancer. And I just simply thought, good. You know, what does he want us to do about it now? He's the one that left us, but God started to speak to my heart. Actually, it was only a couple weeks, and I said to Mark, I need to go see my dad. Well, my brother and I pulled up to the, up to the sidewalk of his apartment, and I remember just the, my heart beating, you know, so fast, walking up to the door, and I'm looking at this yard, and I'm thinking this is decorated like an elderly woman's yard. And I knocked on the door and I thought, oh, phew, dad didn't answer, you know? And so dad's not home <laughs> and, and, and God, I did what you asked and now I'm gonna leave. And my brother said, knock one more time. Well, he opened up the door and said, come on in. And so I'm thinking he, he knew who we were. And I finally thought he doesn't have a clue. And so I looked at him, I said, you don't know who we are. Yes, I do, you're from hospice. I said, no, I'm Denise, your daughter, and this is your son. And the tears that started to well up in his eyes. And my dad got up off the couch and he came over to hug us. He came to my brother and then to myself. And for people to understand the coldness, the hardness of my heart, I couldn't hug my dad back. But to allow him to touch me in that way, to embrace, was just the beginning of God's healing. My dad sat back down, you know, and for the first time as an adult, I was able to share of how that made me feel when I discovered that he was wearing my clothes, how it made me feel when I lost the freedom and uh, the insanity to try to feel good about being a girl. And he sadly looked at me, his eyes actually allowed tears, and he said, Denise, I've done so much to you but I don't remember so much either. I thought, how dare you? How do you not remember? Now, I understood because at nine years old, he had shared with me that he was abused, sexually abused as a child. I understood that he never felt good enough for his father and never connected with his father. I also already knew that my grandmother was an alcoholic and had physically abused my dad. So I expressed my concern for him I knew he was attending an LGBT church and uh, just concerned for his spirituality. And he tried to assure me, saying that he was in a good place and that the church was good and his relationship with God was good. Well, when you've been away for 13 years and you have the discussions that we did and talked and all this pain released, I knew that, you know, felt like at this time the visit was done. And so I got in my brother's car and sat and, and I remember doing this, okay, God did what you asked, I'm done. You know, thinking it was that way. But God's so amazing because he continued from the time of that visit to draw my heart nearer to my dad. 
I found that I would make many trips. I would travel four hours away as often as I could to go see him in the hospital and calling almost daily to say, how are you feeling? So you can see how the Lord was softening my heart and really realizing that I loved him. I just tried to hate him because of all the damage, because of all the hurt and all the pain. I never referred to my dad as Becky or her or she. And I think it's important for people to realize that it wasn't out of that hurt, angry little girl. It honestly wasn't. It was out of the heart of a daughter that wanted her dad to have a reminder of the truth, that this is not who he was, that he was being fooled, that he was being tricked by all the hurt and pain in his life. Today's world, we're told that if you love me, you will call me Becky. It's not the truth. And in a sense, if I called my dad Becky, I'm really lying. That's not the name that his parents gave. And on his birth certificate, he was male. And God created him as male. And in the last visit that my husband and I made there, I was disappointed because he was in a coma. And I'd been searching for all the right scriptures. I wanted to share God's heart for him. And I thought, I don't know if he's going to hear me or not, but I'm going to attempt. And after I read the scriptures, I actually picked my dad's hand up. And this is, this is such a treasure to me uh, because I was warm in his hand. His body was growing cold. It just, it was cold and it seemed to be getting colder. And so there I am rubbing his hand and his arms and trying to warm him up. And then I just realized like, Lord, look at the healing you've done through this time. Denise, with the cold, angry, hurtful heart of a little girl, is now trying to comfort her father. God's healing is miraculous, and it's real, and it's alive. And if we just, as families, seek Him, and as individuals believe in Him, and what He wants to do in and through us, and that's what I began to see. I thought, why is there not a Christian support group? As a child, I just wanted help for our family. And God just drew that passion on my heart. And so it's just help for families with a number four to make it unique, <laughs> you know? And not having any idea how the Lord was gonna use it from an email to a website to all the resources that we offer today. Uh, we offer pastoral support for loved ones and for families. We help families work through their grief process. There's so much behind the scenes, so much pain. The Lord will use us through that with friendship, with companionship, with mentoring, and with counseling. But we can be Jesus with skin on and let them feel loved, possibly for the first time in their life.